Okay, part two of the Calicut lecture. So go back to the notes. Um, so this next part, which is section three on page 274, um, how did ethics originate and grow? So the first thing he wants to do um, uh, is to argue that um, uh, ethics isn't static. Um, the big point in Leopold's discussion is um, that our moral consciousness or our ethical consciousness continues to expand. So, um, eventually, and it's already starting to happen, um, we will and should uh, include the land in our ethical system. That is, we should be ethically concerned about our treatment of the land, just as we are ethically concerned about our treatment of other human beings. And it is natural that this happens because if and in fact I mean he has a lot of evidence on his side um, if you look back at the history of human beings it's clear that our ethical consciousness expands and encompasses more and more uh, different kinds of people um, women uh, minorities etc you know, I mean, the the Greeks, I've said this before, the Greeks used to just, if they had somebody born with Down syndrome, they just threw them outside the city walls and let them die. Um, we don't do that. Um, and places that do things like that, like China, that do things akin to that to baby girls, um, we think is messed up. Nobody thought that that was messed up back then. Nobody. This was not an issue for anybody. Now, even though apparently it's not an issue for some people in China, um, it is a hell of an issue for lots of other people on the planet. This was not the case 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece. Um, so, yeah, I mean... Our moral consciousness expands to um, um, encompass more kinds of things that we think we have a real reason to treat with some semblance of respect. Um, so he says, all right, but in order to um, argue for this position, we have to see where it started, how ethics started, and then see if indeed it has changed from there, and why that might be. Why, by its very nature, ethics changes. Specifically, it changes to encompass more and more things, right? The um, To be concerned with the um, well-being of more and more things. Remember that ethics is a posture of outward looking. Um, when I look inward, that okay, that's selfishness. When I only care about myself. Ethics, by its very nature, focuses on the other. Um, oh, by the way, Keith, this, I had a, a student in my other class make this excellent point um this i mean this it, it's funny we seem to to teach our children that you um take care even if i give you a toy or whatever like i give it to you for christmas um take care of it like have respect for it and just because it's your toy doesn't mean that it's yours to just wantonly destroy. I mean, we, we seem to try to teach children to have respect for objects that they own. Um, so even if you were to maintain that human beings own the planet, which I find hilarious anyway, given that it's clear that in no way do we dominate nature, but whatever, um, let's just say that you maintain that position. 
why does that mean that you can just wantonly exploit it just because it's yours? I mean, we don't teach our children that that is respectful or appropriate behavior even with a toy that they that is theirs that belongs to the child so why why this notion that even if we were to own the planet um that the appropriate mature behavior is just to like wantonly destroy it it does anyway um I think about these things it's, it's pretty important anyway so he says all right so to figure out this whole business about the uh, evolution of ethics we should first look at the origin of ethics how did it start why now this is important um and this um uh, my students in my other class um I had some problems with this point so um uh and you you do need to know it even though you've already done your discussion because you have a an exam right and of course this will be on your exam so certainly you need to know it anyway um so make sure you understand this point if you don't you you know email me or um better yet um ask a question in the um in the forum i think i do i have an open thing in there whatever um ask me is the point here so um let's see this is on oh i didn't write the page down it's on 275 um wait no 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 oh no i'm sorry 274 um section three uh the third full paragraph right hand column um so he had just said in the previous small little paragraph, um, how did ethics originate and so on. So the oldest answer in living human history is theological. The oldest answer to that question, where did ethics come from? Morality. Uh, God, or the gods, imposes morality on people. And God, or the gods, sanctions it. Um, so he talks about Moses um, getting the Ten Commandments from God on Mount Sinai. Um, uh, yeah, that is, that is the oldest answer. Um, uh, but there's a problem with that. Uh, it, it has to be ruled out on principle because what that really means is, um, this is, this is what that, that translates to. Uh, we don't know. We, 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 we don't know where ethics came from because, um, we don't know what God is, right? We don't, but we don't know. I mean, it's the same response that people had to natural phenomena, lightning. Oh, Zeus is throwing his thunderbolts. In other words, yeah, I have no idea what lightning is or why or how it works. Yeah, that's exactly... People didn't know, so they made up symbolic stories about things like that uh they did the same damn thing with ethics um by the way plato 2500 years ago slammed that notion very nicely um that, that ethics could possibly um be created by god uh it's it's a problematic position. It actually does a great injustice, not just to ethics, but to God. Um, if you want to learn more about that, uh, I teach that Platonic Dialogue in um, Core Humanities 201. Um, and it's super amazing and interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, he slammed that idea. Uh, uh, if only more people read Plato, that would be kind of cool but um anyway so i mean the point here uh where does he say this here where does he say this uh, oh here it is um so um 
Calicut also says on page 275, left-hand column, first full paragraph. Uh, an evolutionary natural historian, however, cannot be satisfied with either of these general accounts of the origin and development of ethics. So here's the problem with the first account that God created morality. The idea that God gave morals to man is ruled out in principle. As any supernatural explanation of a natural phenomenon is ruled out in principle on natural science. Um, so that's, I mean, that's his response. Look, it just means that we don't know. Um, I'm not going, it's no longer interesting for human beings to say, um, with all our ability, that we don't know where lightning comes from. Uh, it must be Zeus. Uh, it must be God. God is crying. That's why it's raining. Look, we, we have the ability now to look into these things and to find out some real answers or what approaches real answers about the workings of the natural world. Um, so we better damn well do that. Uh, so just putting it down to some divine or spiritual being is, uh, is not interesting. In the 21st century, that's ridiculous. Um, so we don't do that. The second idea um, is uh, what's provided, been provided by Western philosophy um, for uh, since the ancient Greeks is that um, ethics originates from uh, humans' ability to reason. Now, make sure this is the big idea. You have got to understand this. This is the whole, this is the fundamental idea of this, uh, this whole discussion. So you have to understand why reason um, does not create ethics. And remember, think back to Aristotle. Uh, what is the function of a human being? Activity of the soul in accord with virtue. And this is activity of the rational soul. What he means is using our reason to think through these different virtues to find the mean, the middle ground between the excess and deficiency. The only way you can do that is by, first of all, you, um, you, to, the only way you can figure out what that mean is, is by using the old noggin. And then the way that you perfect your actual behavior in the virtue is with habit. Remember all that stuff? Okay, well, um, that's pretty standard thinking in Western philosophy. That it is human reason that allows us to think through things and figure out what's right and what's wrong, morally speaking. But he says, no, that is also seriously problematic given our recent studies in anthropology. And looking at Darwin, um, it does not, in fact, look like that's what happens does not look like that is how human beings operate. That is not what anthropologists have shown. So it looks like something else is going on. Um, and here's the quote. Um, so go back to that um, 275, that first full paragraph where I was reading. So we went through the idea of God, and that can't be the thing. Um, and, okay, so the, right after that. And while morality might in principle, that's italicized, see that, be a function of human reason, um, uh, is, uh, to suppose that it is so in fact would be to put the cart before the horse. Reason appears to be a delicate, variable, and recently emerged faculty. This is super important. Um, Hobbes agreed with this too, by the, way. by the way. It cannot, under any circumstances, be supposed to have evolved in the absence of complex linguistic capabilities, which depend, in turn, for their evolution upon a highly developed social matrix. But we cannot have become social beings 
unless we assumed limitations on freedom of action and the struggle for existence, which is what he defines ethics as being. Hence, we must have become ethical before we become rational. Okay, I know you are having trouble. I know, it's okay. Um, first of all, let me unpack this idea of ethics as being a limitation on freedom of action and the struggle for existence. Hobbes. That's what Hobbes said. He's just restating it. That's all that that means. Um, remember, in the state of nature, I do not have any limitations on my freedom of action or anything else. Um, I am totally free to do whatever I want, whenever I want to. How well did this work for survival? Not so well. Because everybody then is just killing each other. So, we figure out, alright, here's what we have to do. We have got to put limitations on this freedom. We've got to make some rules. Which means that you can't do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. It's a limitation on your freedom. That is what a civil society is. We have a lot of freedom in this country, more so than in many other countries on the planet. Look, we cannot have total freedom. You've got to have traffic laws. People have to stop at red lights and let the other people go through. You can't just have everybody going through. You have to have rules. I have to, I have, my actions have to be curbed so that and everybody else's actions have to be curbed, too, so that we can all live together. Because, frankly, there are too damn many of us. We don't even live together that well when there are rules. You think it would be better without rules? It's craziness. That's the point. Um, as he sees it, ethics is limitations on our freedom. And it is. Look, I want to um, go and take a bunch of stuff uh, from stores without paying, because wouldn't that be better than paying? Yeah, because then I would have that stuff and have money. And I could use the money to get stuff that there's no way I could steal, right? So why don't I just steal the apple from Walmart, just toss it in my bag, and save the dollar or whatever it is. Um, that sounds better, right? I get more out of that. But ethics has told me, look, stealing is wrong. Blah, 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 blah. So I say, damn it. I want to do this thing. I could. I mean, I could. There's nothing physical stopping me. But there's something ethical stopping me. It's limiting my freedom. If I do it, then I feel guilty or I risk punishment or whatever. Okay? So ethics by its very nature is a limitation on my freedom. Um, so hopefully you understand that. Uh, just think of Hobbes. It's exactly the same idea. Uh, now, so back to this. Uh, let me go into the notes. Um, let's see. Actually, no, no okay. Um, don't go back into the notes yet. We'll go back to that paragraph that I was just reading. Uh, this paragraph, make sure you understand it. Okay, first idea is he says, reason appears to be a delicate, variable, and recently emerged faculty. Um, this looks pretty damn true, um, given uh, all the research into this. Um, and funnily enough, even before there was this kind of research, Hobbes maintained this, that you don't need um, some kind of deep reasoning capacity in the state of nature. Um, you pretty much just kind of need common sense. Um, you, I, look, in the state of nature, I don't need to read this essay and figure this out. How is that going to help me like survive better when... There's probably some guy creeping up behind me right now about to kill me and take my stuff or enslave me and whatever. The, 
I don't need the skill, the deep reasoning skills for mere survival. I need common sense and stuff, and that's fine. And the ability to um, draw conclusions from repeated experience or something, right? Um, it worked really well to do this uh, to make fire, so um, it seems to work better than doing this to make fire. So I'll keep doing this one thing. Um, that's pretty much all you need. You don't need anything much beyond that. So reason, um, the, the kind of critical ability that human beings have now is not something that we have always had. Um, in fact, it looks like, and this, this shocks the hell out of me, because, uh, but I guess I didn't live 300 years ago to compare it, but the human um, IQ, j average, hmm. is going up all the time, about two points, um, I think it's every five years or something, I forget what the, um, whatever, however many years it is, it's about five, it's something like that, it's small, which is also unbelievable to me, um, but it's going up two points. That's amazing, uh, especially because I don't know what people are doing with those two points some of the time, but fine. Um, so his point here is that, look, if reason is so recently emerged as a faculty, Ethics doesn't seem to be recently emerged. Um, they seem to, uh, pe human beings all over the planet seem to have had, even if we don't think that their ethical system now is uh, good, they had something. And they, I mean, the Ten Commandments, for God's sake, is an ethical system. Thou shalt and thou shalt not. Um, this is thousands of years ago. So how, you know, exactly what's going on here. Um, it looks like on the face of it, ethics came before reason. Now, he fills in the blanks. So, in fact, he is going to argue, and I, he, um, he could fill this in further, but look, he doesn't need to. Um, he's right about this stuff. Um, this is well-documented stuff. It's tough, but it's it's well documented. Um, reason, uh, critical reasoning ability, um, cannot occur without language in a human being. Um, think about this: the um, the ability for deep critical thinking, deep reasoning, uh, is based on concepts. Um, so I reason from one concept to the next. Um, even forming concepts is already uh, indicative of pretty serious reasoning capacity. So, look, this is a book, right? This is one particular book, but I also have another book here. Um, these are individual objects, but I recognize there's something similar about them, such that I make, I create this umbrella concept book, and I can use the idea of what is similar about these objects, and then go forth in the future and apply that concept to new objects that I see. So, pretty much, I, I I've got down the concept of book pretty well. The concept of something like God or love is a little trickier, but book, I think I've got that one. So when I go forth into the world, I'm pretty damn adept at spotting and naming books. That object is a book. And then if somebody says, what is a book? Look, I can give a pretty decent definition just without having even thought of it. Um, uh, object made out of some kind of paper material with uh, writing on it that 
uh, puts forth ideas or a story or something. Right? Look, that, that's decent enough without having considered anything. Um, but all of that requires reasoning capacity. I need to be able to see different objects, note similarities, and say, well, though there are differences, because look, I mean, this book and this book are, I mean, they're different sizes, they're different colors, they're, this is about Jesus and Buddha. This book is about ethics and stuff. Like, what the hell do they have in common? Um, the, the authors are different, the pages are different, some of the language, the languages used in them are different. In what way are they both the same thing? Why do they both, why are they both classed under the same concept book? Well, because they're the main thing about them that seems to make them what they are. Um, some kind of essential feature, hearkening back to Aristotle, um, seems to be the same. And since I used the noggin to figure that out, right, now I can go forth and figure that out with new things. But look, I needed to have learned language first. Babies cannot go forth and note similarities like that. They don't have any of these concepts. They don't know what a book is. They don't know what writing is. They don't know what a story is. Um, and look, if you want to look into this further, by all means, um, it absolutely does not look in any way like human beings have the ability for deep, critical thinking and reasoning before they have acquired language. And even some human beings who have acquired language still don't have the capacity for uh, deep critical thinking. But that's just because they're not trying a lot of the time. <clears throat> not because they couldn't, right? Keep that in mind. By the way, the more, um, the greater your vocabulary, the more concepts with which you're familiar, um, the more ways you have of describing the world, understanding it deeply, um, then the more you can think about it and the easier it is to figure things out or the more interesting things you can figure out. Um, usually three-year-olds, I don't know how many words kids know at three, but look, they don't know uh, the same amount of words that I know. I'll tell you that right now. And um, there's no possible way they could describe the experience of love or cruelty like I could. I don't even know if they could give a definition of that kind of thing. A deep, legitimate definition of love or cruelty. Or what about uh, divinity? What about God? What about death? I mean, how... Look, it, it doesn't, uh, language is superbly important for the acquisition of everything else that um, uh, is important to us. Almost everything, except for ethics. Um, now, but he says, look, here's the funny thing. There is no linguistic acquisition. I mean, you don't acquire language unless you have other people to talk to. If you're the only guy, why are you creating a whole bunch of concepts? You don't have anyone you need to explain anything to. You don't need to acquire language if you are solitary. So it looks like Human beings acquired language because they were faced with a dilemma. There are other human beings here. I need to tell them where that bush with the berries are that aren't poisonous. My leg is broken. I can't go and show them. I have to tell them somehow, but we don't have a word for bush or berry or right and then make a left or something. We don't have words. Crap. How are we going to survive if I can't communicate things like that to them? 
I guess I have to find a way to communicate things like that to them. So we make up words and concepts because other people are around and we're trying to work together to do things. So society is necessary for the acquisition of language and language is necessary for the acquisition of the deep kind of reasoning Aristotle is really talking about when he's talking about um, how to figure out what the virtues are, the mean between excess and deficiency and things like that. Um, by the way, this does not mean that Aristotle is wrong. Um, uh, the, all you have to say about it is that um, after ethics has originated and um, once it becomes more complex, then reason is required to do more with it. Uh, and yes, I think that's absolutely the case. Um, so ethics starts without reason, um, but after reason is acquired, ethics becomes more, much more sophisticated as a system. And uh, it seems to have done just that, and that's part of the point of the expansion of moral consciousness, right? Uh, so anyway, so society is necessary for language. Language is necessary for reason. And then reason is necessary to make ethics more sophisticated than it was. But that means it was already there before reason was there. That's why he's denying what these Western philosophers have tended to say, that reason is necessary for ethics. He says, no, 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 no. If reason is necessary for anything, it's necessary for uh, making ethics more sophisticated, but it is not necessary for the origin of ethics. Ethics did not originate because of the reasoning capacity of human beings. It looks like it originated for some other reason. And we know this, we can see this by looking at this, um, this link of connection. Reason, for that is required language. For that is required society. Hobbes, civil society. You can't have one without ethics, without moral rules. Because people want to secure their own survival. And they will take down the other guy if that means that his survival is more secured by doing so. How do we stop that and get into the civil society? We make rules. Ethical ones, among other ones, like traffic rules. Right? So, it looks like society can only be formed if we already have some sense of ethics. That's where the next part comes in. He says, okay, well, where did this sense of ethics come from. Ethics is some kind of concern for the well-being of another, um, either in addition to a concern for your own well-being or in lieu of a concern for your own well-being. Um, I mean, you ask a parent and look, they will die for their children, many of them, um, but they are absolutely more concerned for the well-being of their offspring than themselves. And we think this is noble and natural and awesome. Uh, it, where did that come from? It doesn't look like that. We, we feel that, like, look, if any of you are parents, I'm not. But, of course, I know parents, and I have parents myself. Um... I know how they feel about me, and my God, uh, yeah, they would, um, they would die for me, and I, I know that deeply. Um, if any of your parents, or think to your own parents, um, you know, I, I hope you would all say the same thing. Uh, um, I, I hope so, but look, we didn't, we don't feel that way about our offspring because. <laughs> We have reasoned and figured out that 
that's the way it should be. No, 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 no. It doesn't look like that is where that sort of concern for the other's well-being comes from. It comes from something, a, a, a very different part of the human animal, and it is not here. Um, so what he says then is feelings or sentiments are natural and widespread in the animal kingdom, uh, much more so than reason. And it, it looks like other animals besides human beings uh, also illustrate a deep concern for the welfare of their offspring um, uh, and are willing to sacrifice themselves for the survival of their offspring. Um, human beings are not the only ones who are like that. And, I mean, other animals don't have anything close to the same kind of um, reasoning capacity that we do. So we've already figured out that, like, reason can't be the thing. Um, but it looks like just sort of natural feelings f it, that, as he says, seems to occur in the majority of mammals. He, he talks specifically about mammals here, right? Um, those natural feelings for one's offspring and in some mammals for one's mate, um, there, there are uh, numerous mammals that have the, the same kind of concern, uh, natural concern for uh, their mate. And humans are one of those and, and numerous others. But um, it looks like we sort of come into the world with this natural um, concern, a, a bond, um, um, a, a concern for the well-being of very close, familial others. Um, so let's see where so I the first thing I say then so parental and filial affection in mammals allowed for the formation of small social groups. So um I and my mate have two babies and I care very much for my babies and that seems just natural like they were born and I was in love and um with them and I hear this from parents all the time that as soon as they saw their baby uh they fell in love men and women, uh, mothers and fathers. I've heard exactly the same thing. Um, and um, it brings the mother and father closer together often. Um, it um, deepens their bond. So it looks like those kinds of mammalian bonds are natural to most mammals. So that forms a small social group right? Mother, father, and offspring. Um, then, um, oh, actually, let's read where he says this business. Um, go down to so the last paragraph on the left-hand column on 275. Darwin's account, to which Leopold unmistakably alludes, uh, begins with the parental and filial affections common perhaps to all mammals. Bonds of affection and sympathy between parents and offspring permitted the formation of small social groups. Now, should the parental and familial affections bonding these family members chance to extend to less closely related individuals, that would permit an enlargement of the group. And if that happens, if I enlarge the group a little bit, um, and that that allows me to better survive. Um, as he says, if that um, newly extended community should more successfully defend itself and or more efficiently provision itself, the inclusive fitness of its members severally would be increased. Here's what he's saying. So I and my mate have the offspring and we care, for, we're just, a group of four and we care for each other and it just seems natural we didn't have to decide to care we just kind of did and then we realize um, <coughs> so like my mate would be male and say we have two daughters and he realizes you know my wife sorry but my, my dog is snoring um, 
my wife is small and kind of scrawny. You know, I have two baby girls. Um, I... If somebody comes to attack us, I'm the only one who can fight back. And that's going to be rough. Um, we're not going to be able to survive as well as we could if we had some other strong males in the group. Or some strong females, if they're are those around us and the other neighboring tribes? Um, safety in numbers, right? So, you know, my cousin, Bob, lives over there with his wife and his son. And his son's a teenager. And they've been doing pretty well. His son is a strapping young lad. And Bob is a couple of years younger than me. So, um, he's really strapping, too. Well, you know, I like Bob. I mean, uh, we really haven't teamed up or anything, but he seemed like a nice guy, and I've got a nice family. What if we make a little group with them? Let's bring them into the fold, right? And see if maybe this helps. Um, it might be that we won't have enough food to go around now, but let's see if we can make do. So we bring Bob and his family in, and we find out that now we have more people looking for food and able to gather it faster, uh, cook it faster, do more stuff um, to take care of everything. I'm not the only one taking care of the babies anymore um, because Bob's wife wants to help, and there's uh, two of us to shield the babies instead of just me or something. And um, now when somebody comes to attack, we have three strapping men to take care of it. And then the two women shielding the baby girls. So we're all actually uh, better off now. This is looking pretty good. Also, the interesting thing is that with more of us together... You know what I, I notice? You know, Bob and his wife and his son have had, you know, sort of their own language, their own way of doing things. But now we have to sort of communicate in a different way, you know, uh, allow each group to understand each other, to make one group. Funnily enough, it makes us, it forces us to come up with new concepts to be able to communicate efficiently with one another. Um, and, you know what else is funny? Bob, I thought Bob was just kind of weird. He had these, like, weird, crazy ideas about how to, you know, cut down a tree and, and get lumber. But, funnily enough, his method is way more efficient. And then... We were bouncing some ideas off of each other, and we together came with some really new and interesting methods for some other daily tasks that we have to do. So the more people with the more ideas working together and thinking makes us all not only better able to survive, because we're all helping each other, working as a team, but it makes us more intelligent. We come up with new ideas, new ways of doing things that are better than the old. We have more people with whom we can bounce off ideas. So you're saying that when people get out of their little comfort zone and they start to hear new ideas in the big city, that they have the potential to become more intelligent? Isn't that part of what school is supposed to do? Whoa, this is amazing, right? Mm-hmm, I know. Um, of course, this is how things go. So, as he says, we realize when we extend our concern for others a little bit further than just our basic smallest family group, we extend this concern for others and create a little bit of a bigger group, 
things just start going better and better. Also, you know what's funny too? Bob has had this enemy. And he's been always living over there across the river. And he and Bob are just arch nemesis, this other guy. Um, and uh, he's always giving Bob a hard time and stealing Bob's food. I went over there and I talked to this guy. I asked him to join us. I said, let's let bygones be bygones. Let's not be enemies. Let's be friends. Work with us. We'll help you. You help us. Let's do this upright. We see that you've got a really good method for gathering water and bringing it back to your site. We've got a great method for uh, cutting down trees and getting the lumber. Let's share. Let's work together. So this guy comes over and he and Bob are, you know, at first they're still a little standoffish, but they get used to it and... Um, all of a sudden, Bob doesn't have to worry anymore about this guy stealing his food. Because he turned his enemy into a friend. So, he doesn't have as many people trying to hurt him. Which means, he has more people on his team trying to help him, and fewer enemies out there trying to kill him! which means he is more likely to survive. And he's more likely to flourish because this guy actually has some really fantastic ideas. And he and Bob find out that in fact they have a lot of the same values. Um, they have the same sense of humor. They actually become pretty good friends. And they really enjoy each other's company. It's amazing. When I bring more friends into my life, how much more fulfilled I feel. How many more people with whom I can be intimate and share myself. It's nice. In so many ways expanding my concern for others to include more and more and more helps me. It helps me to survive and to thrive. Hmm. You know, it doesn't help hating people. Because then they hate me back and then they threaten my survival and they threaten my ability to thrive because hatred is a negative emotion. It's an emotion that doesn't make me feel good. But friendship and, and love and laughter and learning and awesome experiences with your buddies that makes me feel good in <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> and it gives me a reason to get up in the morning too. And then I find out that when I extend that ethical system, that concern for others to this animal, this little, this little, um, Coyote who keeps coming around our camp, and he's he's a little baby. He's a coyote pup, and he keeps coming around. I've been feeding him a little bit, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe if I get him closer, I can uh, slaughter him and we can eat him. But, you know, uh, he comes around, and I started to look forward to him, and it becomes sort of a bright spot in my day when the coyote comes around. And, in fact, I... I gave him a silly little name. You know, he'll come around close enough and, you know, we'll probably roast him one night. But, um, I like him. He's he's cute. He's funny. And he, you know, the other night he came up and he licked my hand. And, jeez, that's... Maybe I... Maybe I won't eat him. Maybe I... Maybe... Maybe he could... 
be a kind of friend. You know, he he gives me a watching him and, and, and petting him and when he licks my hand and stuff gives me this feeling this that as much as I love my humans, um it's different. It's a different friendship. It's nice. Really nice. And maybe the, the coyote becomes part of our little group. The more we expand our kindness for all kinds of others. It just looks like we become more fulfilled in so many ways. Um, at first, the, the point here is that it, at first it um, enables us to better survive. And, um, well, if it does that, then we realize that if we continue to expand it, we'll survive even better. Fewer enemies, more friends, more defense, um, and then all the other wonderful things come. The intelligence, the intimacy, the bonds, um, all those wonderful things that we get um, by working as a team with the other creatures, living and non-living, on this planet. Uh, look, I there's a reason that people don't uh, want all the trees cut down. There's a reason that people like flowers and they don't want to see them just trampled. They, those things do matter to us. They, they do make our lives better if we pay attention to them. Um, they really do. And we, we don't seem as human beings to just want those things maintained just to maintain our own survival. Um, they seem to give us more than just survival. Um, they, they seem to give us fulfillment and, and beauty and meaning and purpose and I mean, we see human beings for oh, time immemorial have seen God in nature. Nature is the greatest illustration of God, of the universe, of meaning. We don't want it destroyed. But we, um, we don't live in a way that is, needs to be close to it anymore. So we take it for granted, just like we take for granted most things we're not so close to anymore. to our great detriment. Right. Very sad. Um, so, now go to the next paragraph um, on the right-hand column, 275. Morality, properly speaking, that is, morality is opposed to mere altruistic instinct, which is what we started out with. We started out with just this altruistic instinct, um, this just natural concern for offspring and possibly for the mate. Um, but we expand that concern um, in thinking that it might aid in our survival. When we see that it does indeed aid in our survival, 
we now have a uh, reason to do it. Um, which is why, in fact, look, I don't, um, I don't know any of the women in the Congo who are being raped as I'm speaking, um, by hordes of men or the little girls in the Congo, the rape capital of the world, who are being raped so violently that it breaks their pelvis and they die from internal bleeding. I don't know any of those girls, those women, those babies, baby girls who are raped. I don't know them. I don't know what they look like. I don't know their names. I'm never going to see them. Um, I don't have uh, some kind of like natural instinctive bond to human beings or anything that I cannot see and have never seen and, and don't even know exist except as a concept that women and children and baby girls in the Congo are raped constantly. That's what I know. Um, um, so my concern for them is not altruistic instinct. I was not born with a concern like that, with a bond like that. Um, that came later, uh, after my moral system was honed by reason, among other things. Um, uh, that's what he's talking about. We don't just care anymore about the couple of people in our families or whatever. We care about injustices on the planet against humans, against animals, against the environment, on principle. Even if I will never see those creatures, even if it will never directly affect my daily existence, I care on principle. I do not use any shampoo or cosmetics or deodorant or toothpaste or whatever else, body stuff, soap, whatever, that has been tested on animals because it is brutal and horrific. I encourage you also, if you can stomach such a thing, to... Google, go on Google Images and look up animal testing and look at the pictures. Um, it is sick. And I don't use those products. I buy products by companies that do not test on animals. And it's easy to do because they're everywhere. Um, Trader Joe's brand doesn't test on animals. So I use their stuff and it's fine. Um, not a big deal. But, um, look, I'm never going to see those animals, probably because they're only going to be alive for a couple of days, tortured, and then they're going to die. Um, we have an animal testing facility here in Reno, by the way. Uh, so, I'm never going to see them. I'm never going to hear their screams of agony. And by the way, by animals here, I mean dogs, cats, and rabbits are the three on which we test cosmetics and shampoo the most. So, not rats and mice, which I'm never going to be able to get you to care for. Um, dogs. Your dog could have been tested on. Um, I'm never going to see him. I'm never going to hear him. Oh, except for when I watch the video on YouTube of an animal testing facility. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes of my life. Uh, because it was horrible and brutal. And they were kicking the dogs. I don't know what that has to do with testing, but apparently that's what you do. Because um, we should kick animals wantonly. Um, that's fine. Um... I still care. I still care about them, even though I'm never going to see them. I still care. 
about, um, uh, what's her, oh God, if I could even pronounce her name, the Russian gal, um, the member of the band uh, Pussy Riot, um, who is uh, the Russian government, <clears throat> which is uh, pretty tyrannical, uh, and has locked her up. Um, read about this. It's scary what's going on over there. Um, very oppressive regime. Uh, anyway. Um, look, I'm never going to see her or meet her or... I, I still care, in principle, that the... I'm never going to go to Russia. Like It's just not going to happen. If I travel, it's probably not going to be to Moscow. Um, I still care, on principle, that governments are doing this to the people. And the, the, whole, the gay people in Russia, what's going on there with that stuff now? It, I, I can't. These are crimes against humanity. I'm never going to meet these members of humanity. And I care about it. And that's what he's talking about. And we have a reason to care. And the primary reason is merely Hobbesian. The more we expand our ethical system, the more we're willing to work as a team with more stuff, not just other humans, not just other humans who are like me, white or female or American, but all kinds of other humans, and animals, and the land, the more likely we are to survive and thrive. And we have discovered that we are not able to thrive very well when we are constantly at war, when we constantly hate each other, when we are constantly destroying the land. Because we need it to live off of. And we're getting better is the point. The moral consciousness is expanding. Um, if only the practice were following along as quickly. But it's not. Um, anyway. Uh, now, look, oh, this, um, Quote on 276, this is good, um, left-hand column, first full paragraph. For purposes of more effective defense against common enemies, or because of increased population density, or in response to innovations in subsistence methods or technologies, or for some mix of these or other forces, human societies have grown in extent or scope and changed in form or structure. Um, and he mentions some Native American um, peoples came into being upon the merger of previously separate mutually hostile tribes um, animals and plants were domesticated hundreds of gatherers became hurt the point is these people who used to be enemies these different tribes came together and they expanded their technologies and they found more efficient ways of um, doing things and then also they weren't, like, fighting, so they didn't have to worry that this tribe was going to try to kill them because now this tribe was their friend and they're working together. And when you have more people putting forth more ideas, you are just, based on probability, more likely to hit on a good one, which is why it is so stupid for countries to oppress 50% of their population, women. Women have had and do have plenty of excellent ideas. And you, I mean, when you don't have 50% of your population putting forth any of the ideas, you're just less likely to hit on good ones as often. Duh! I, I mean, who is not figuring this out? I, well, never mind. Morons are not figuring this out. Terrible people whose moral consciousness does not seem to be expanding very much. Um, terrible. Now, uh, 
Where am I here? Hang on. I have no idea where I'm getting this from. 276. Well, whatever. Um, so the next point, whatever. Um, the tribal group will widen further to include members of the entire nation and then a global community. And this has indeed been happening. Um, so not only do I care, you know, just about my uh, people in Reno or something, you know, I'm concerned about the state of Nevada. I'm very concerned about the public education system in the entire state, not just in Reno. I actively, um, being a faculty member at a state school in Nevada, I care about what's going on at the other schools, and I need to, and all the other faculty do, do too. Um, but not only that, because it's not just our state that's a problem, but it is our federal, federal, federal public education system. Um, federal laws, not just state laws, um, are a serious problem. Um, and that's why the United States doesn't have the best public education system of all time. Um, and it's the country as a whole. It's not just a couple of states. Like, every other state is just fantastic, and Nevada is really low. By the way, we are super low. By the way, the um, average IQ in Nevada is 95, which is really low. And um, uh, that is absolutely correlated with our poor public education system. So the next time somebody just passes you through and gives you A's and then I give you a D and you don't like me for it, I'm the one who's going to challenge you and raise your IQ. If people don't challenge their students and they just pass them on through, that's why students have a 95 IQ in this state on average because nobody challenged them. Gotta do hard work to become stronger, right? So, um, I don't just care, though, about Nevada, just because I live here. I actually care a lot about California, too, because they have a lot to do with what goes on in Nevada. Um, and I have a concern for what's going on in the federal government, because that has a lot to do with what happens in state schools. And I have a concern because I'm an American about other Americans. And I have a concern about other women, be they Russian, members of a punk rock band, be they women in the Congo being raped. I don't care. I concern myself with what's happening to all women. And I concern myself with what's happening to gay people and to straight people and to white men and to black men and to any other group of human beings you want to list. Because even though it does, they don't actively take part in my daily life, man, does it have something to do with our government. And man, does our government have something to do with me. Um, and that's why I also care about animals in the land. So, um, it's pretty natural, as these guys see it, to expand our concern um, well beyond our initial small tribe, okay? Um, and so, as he says, then, um, let's see, uh, the top of 277, right-hand column, I, oh, I guess I put all that in there. Um, so the next step after um, expanding our ethical system to include human beings of other tribes and nations and so on um, uh, is to um, expand it to include the ecosystem, the land itself. Um, as members of a global community, since um, they are. <laughs> Obviously, right? Uh, so top there, ecological theory provides a synchronic link, the community concept, a sense of social integration of human and non-human nature. Human beings, plants, animals, soils, and waters are all interlocked in one humming community of cooperations and competitions, 
one biota. The simplest reason, to paraphrase Darwin, should tell each individual that he or she ought to extend his or her social instincts and sympathies to all the members of the biotic community, though different from him or her in appearance or habits. The point here is that all of these, look, I don't live in a vacuum. That is not how ecosystems work on this planet. Everything affects everything else. That means then, therefore, it logically entails that if I care about me, I better damn well care about everything else. Because it is, it's all interwoven. It all has something to do with me. So it only makes sense to extend my ethics and care about other things. And his point is that the, we're doing so, and we're doing so because we recognize that it is um, to our detriment not to do so, that we need, if we want to survive and thrive, to care about other things. Okay, so basic idea, um, let's see, blah, 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 I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through all of this right now. Um, so he does make this point on the next page, 278, um, that the land, land ethic is not anthropocentric. He goes through this long tirade about, um, the history of, um, uh, moral philosophy, uh, you don't need to know it. Don't worry about it. Just, you should know the things I put in my notes. That's funny. Um, so the land ethic is not anthropocentric. Um, moral behavior is no longer dependent on what is only good for humans. Um, and he says this, where is this one? Oh, um, here, the, so 278, left-hand column, first full paragraph, the bigger one on the top. So right at the bottom of it, three lines, last three lines. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Um, so if I maintain the integrity, stability um, of the biotic community, of the ecosystem, um, that in turn absolutely maintains me and everything else. But... Um, that's not the only reason I do it, right? It's specifically not anthropocentric. I don't do it just for me. Um, I do it because it's right. And uh, it's right because I am naturally a part of a community. And the land is part of that community. And it is right for me to be concerned with the welfare of others within my community. The land is an other within my community. Therefore, it is right to concern myself with it. Um, so as he says next, um, it's not anthropocentric. Uh, the land eth ethic is much more holistic. Um, moral... Moral behavior is no longer dependent on what is good for individuals, either plant, animal, or human. It's dependent on what is good for the community as a whole. Um, so um, this is at least um, somewhat utilitarian. So if you want to think back to that. Um, and this, we do this often. Um, there will be a species of animal, the, a threatened um, species that's almost to extinction. And um, in order to preserve it, we might have to um, uh, kill off um, some other animals in the area or move them or do something. Um, but the point is we have to sacrifice something oftentimes. Oops. Oh, great. Um, Sorry, my computer just did something dumb. Um, oftentimes, we have to sacrifice something in order to um, um, allow for a species to survive. And it's a bigger deal um, than sacrificing those individuals 
of a species that is thriving and it's fine, like deer or something. It's a far bigger deal to maintain uh, biodiversity than it is to concern ourselves with the few individuals. So if um, killing the individuals of the thriving species will allow for the continued growth of a threatened species, we need to do it. Okay? Um, so we have a real concern for the community over the individual. Now, he goes on, and I can't, my monitor went off, so I can't even, I can't read anything in my notes now. Ah. Um, but he goes on to say, um, look, that doesn't mean that, because um, obviously what that, I mean, that suggests we better kill off a couple of billion human beings um, if, if we need to be more concerned with the planet than the individuals, because, um, we're killing the planet, so we should, let's kill off about three billion. We should be okay then. That'll be fine for a while. Um, okay, so he's, he's, he's not going to argue for that, right? No, nobody's going to be on his team about that one. Um, uh, so he says, look, there's a, of course we have, um, a responsibility to the greater community, but the clo it's like the, that's where he uses the, um, um, image of the uh, tree rings. Um, so the, the greatest, the, the, the biggest biotic community is our, is absolutely the, uh, a concern and we need to consistently be concerned with it, um, in everything that we do. But, um, there are smaller rings and so like I'm in the middle. So my family, my close family, my mother, my father, my sister, brother, and my best friends, are more of a concern to me than um, the strangers um, that I, or acquaintances, right? My, my acquaintances. I'm more concerned with my close people than my acquaintances. Um, and I'm more concerned with my acquaintances than total strangers. And I'm more concerned with what's happening in Reno than what's happening in Vegas. And I'm more concerned with what's happening in Vegas than what's happening in California. But I still need to be concerned about all of those things because they are all a part of my community, ultimately, and they all affect my tiny little ring in the very center. They all affect it. Um, so I need to concern myself with all of that stuff. It's all my community. So that's what he's saying, ultimately, is... Um, the community, our community is a lot bigger than we tend to think. Um, and if we have a responsibility to any kind of community, um, if we think that just our family and friends are a community, that then we're wrong. Like, that's factually incorrect. Um, so we have a responsibility to our full community. And um, we're realizing that. Moral consciousness is expanding to um, um, to be concerned with those outer rings more and more. And by doing so, we are helping everything to be better. Um, okay, so any questions, send me an email. Bye, guys.